Welcome to the first lesson in the Macbeth Scribbly courses. So this course is basically for anyone who's studying Macbeth at any level. Even if you're at university level, or you're doing a really high level literature course, you can always benefit from going over the basics again with a text before you go into the really complex, detailed stuff. So even if you're at a super high level, this is for you and if you're just starting out on Macbeth like you're in year nine or you're about to do it for your GCSEs then this is definitely going to help you a lot. So I've structured these lessons around going through everything you need to know for exams at any level so sometimes it might say something like a level or higher level on a lesson that means if you're doing GCSE you don't necessarily need to take that lesson but if you're doing A level and above, I would recommend taking it. If you feel like really pushing yourself at GCSE and you're aiming for top grades, feel free to take those as well because they'll just enhance your understanding of the text. So this one's for everyone. And we're just gonna start with a summary of the actual story. Even if you've not read Macbeth the play yet or you've not seen a version of it, it's good to know the story. And this is kind of a good rule that I apply to everything to do with literature. So literature is different from if you're just watching a story for fun because if you're watching it for fun, you kind of want to know, you don't want to know what happens before it happens. Like you don't want to get this, the story ruined for you, for example. You shouldn't really treat literature in the same way because it's not about kind of um, that process of like experiencing it in the moment so much as it is about going really deep into how it works and why it works in a certain way and what types of ideas it's trying to express. So it can be really confusing if you just pick up Shakespeare, especially if you're not used to the language of Shakespeare and you just try and read it from start to end. You might find that really confusing because the language is difficult, the story is pretty complex, there's a lot of elements, there's a lot of characters. So whether you feel overwhelmed or not, I always think it's a good, a good idea to start with knowing the story of a literature text before you actually read the book or read the, the play or watch the play. If you don't really want to ruin surprises, then do read it or watch it first. But yeah, like I say, literature is more about kind of going back over the same story lots of times to figure out why it's interesting and, and really special. So um, yeah, it's not kind of cheating or anything <laughs> to have a look at the, the actual plot first. So um, yeah, we're gonna go through all of the acts. I'm gonna just kind of speak about what it says here. There is a copy of this on our Medium blog and I'll probably upload one to the Scribbly page as well. So if you wanna download this or print it out, it's probably a good idea as well. If, uh, yeah, if you're studying Macbeth, you can kind of refer back to it that way. So, um, yeah, so let's start. You can make notes in this lesson if you want, but you don't necessarily have to. So most scribbly lessons are based around note taking, whereas this one is more like me just talking at you a bit, as you probably realised. <laughs> yes, yeah, so it's more an introduction to the ideas in the story. So, act one. Um, 1.1 1. 1 means Act 1, Scene 1. We meet the witches, they tell us the story of Macbeth. They're discussing battle between Scotland and Norway. Duncan is the king of Scotland, Macbeth is fighting for Duncan. Macbeth is a war general. The only people we meet in the first scene are the witches. So it's really important that Duncan you, in, you know who Duncan is, you know that he's the king, and you know that Macbeth is a soldier, basically, a very high up soldier. And that um, the witches are involved from the very beginning. I always really like this scene because we meet the witches before we actually meet any of the characters involved in the action of the play because they're sort of outside of the action and they just kind of sit around and comment on it and predict what's going to happen. So if you're thinking of like a football match or something, they're the spectators, whereas everyone else would be the footballers. So it's kind of interesting because they, they provide this extra layer of perspective on the text. Um, and they raise all sorts of weird questions about how involved or not involved are they. So um, yeah, Macbeth is a soldier. Duncan is king. There's a fight going on already. 
Um, we only hear about these from the witches. We don't actually meet any of these characters yet. So the second one, 1.2, the captain appears and provides Duncan, provides Duncan, <laughs> and tells Duncan about Macbeth. A student wrote this, so I'm, I'm just going to edit it a little bit as we go through. <laughs> about Macbeth and Banquo's um, success in battle. So this is the bit where he says uh, Macbeth and Banquo kind of chop their way through a load of soldiers up to the traitor who is fighting against the king. And they, uh, Macbeth unseamed him from the nave to the chops and fixed his head upon the battlements, which is always a quote that sticks in my head because it's really gruesome imagery. <laughs> Um, and it basically means cut him in half from his tummy up to his head and then chopped his head off and stuck it on a spike on the castle walls. So yeah, really gross and um, gory. It's near Halloween, so I'm kind of into gory stuff at the moment, which is why I decided to film this course now because uh, I really love Halloween. So, <laughs> But yeah, um, it's worth noting if you're not super into gruesome kind of spooky stuff like witches or gory stuff like violence which not everyone's into and I can totally understand why there's a lot to do with different things that you can you can kind of click with in Macbeth that aren't necessarily those like glib sort of bloody or supernatural elements so just try and read it in more of a historical way or in more of a way that's like maybe political to do with like um the relationship between the women and the men or inferior and superior positions so you can read it in a less spooky gory way if you want I really like spooky gory so I tend to sort of lean towards those elements of it but it's not all about that so with any text try and find something that makes you click with it and something that really resonates with you so you, you find it interesting and that kind of gives you an angle into what you're reading and studying and makes it more enjoyable. So yeah, I like the gory angle, so that's something that appeals to me. I don't know why, just always really like gore. So, um, yeah, so there's a random captain, he comes, he talks to the king about how great Macbeth and Banquo have been in this battle where this, um, Norwegian guy is trying to take over and kill the king and so on. So Duncan sends this um, kind of uh, traitor, like a thane is like a lord that he would have within his kingdom. So one of the lords has turned against him and joined Norway and he sends that guy to be killed. And he's really happy with Macbeth and Banquo. So thane just means lord and Lords are people that have certain kind of land and castles and things and they, uh, they're they responsible for a portion of the country and all of the lords in a country are answerable to the king. So the king kind of governs them all. So yeah, Thane of Cawdor, um is bad because he joined the Norwegians and then he's killed and Duncan's very depressed about the Thane of Cawdor, but he's very happy with Macbeth and Banquo. There's kind of suggestions that Macbeth and Banquo only won, uh, sorry, the battle was only won because of Macbeth and Banquo, that they were so instrumental to the whole thing, they were so important, that without them it might not have, it might not have worked out and Duncan might have been killed, so he's really, really grateful to them, basically. So 1.3 is where we first meet Macbeth and we also meet his friend Banquo. And it's back on the moor, so it's the same setting as 1.1. Moorland, if you're not sure what that is, it's like very high up fields that are sort of rocky and not many plants grow there. Um, I, I grew up all around moorland because where I live it's like the peak district basically, so there's loads of <laughs> very high rocky fields with cliffs and mountains and things around. So a moorland is, is that type of thing. 
Um, this is set in Scotland, so there's tons of moorland. You can even do an image search of uh, of like Scottish moorland to get an idea of what that looks and feels like. Quite cold, misty, quite spooky sort of setting. So Macbeth and Banquo meet the witches. The witches foreshadow the succession of Macbeth um, as the Thane of Cawdor. Again, uh, like I say, one of my students wrote this for me, so I'll just edit as we go. Um, and eventually the King of Scotland. So they, this is where they do their prophecies and they say, um, all hail to thee, Macbeth, Thane of Glams, because he's already Thane of Glams, Thane meaning Lord. So he, he's the Lord of um, an area called Glams. And then they say, hail to thee, Thane of Cawdor, which is confusing because he's not the Lord of Cawdor. He's only he's only in charge of Glams at that time. And then they say, um, that shalt be king, that or thou. I can't remember if it's that or thou, but something shalt be king hereafter. Thou shalt be king hereafter, I think. Um, which means after that, you're going to end up as the king of Scotland. And the witches tell Banquo, because Banquo gets annoyed and he's like, oh, you told Macbeth all this amazing stuff about his life, you've not told me anything. So, um, yeah, the witches tell Banquo that uh, thou shalt get kings, though thou be none, which means you're going to have kings, so your sons will be kings, but you'll never be a king yourself. So, that's a very important scene. Um, that one is a very important scene. It's worth kind of going through. I would recommend, um, if you do print this off, go and highlight the key scenes so that you know to go over them several times because the more important the scene is, the more likely it is to come up in a question or be useful in an essay answer. So when you're doing Shakespeare, you don't want to kind of treat every single scene equally because it will just take you forever and it's kind of a waste of time. You want to identify what are the really important moments of the story and what scenes are those in, and then focus maybe 80% of your attention on those moments and 20% on the other bits in between. So 1.4, King Duncan's castle. Duncan's upset that the Thane betrayed him. He decides to make Macbeth the new Thane of Cawdor. Macbeth is surprised because it shows that the witch's prophecies are starting to come true. Duncan's son Malcolm says that he will become the next king, which actually really annoys Macbeth because he gets a bit confused about how is he going to be king if Duncan's son's going to be king. Like, you know, it's just not going to work. So, um, yeah, that kind of starts off all of the, the doubting and the chaos that happens in the play. 1.5. Sorry, I just had to pause and cough there <laughs> to what happened to my throat. Macbeth's castle in Inverness. Um, I actually lost pub quiz once because there's a question about where was Macbeth's castle and I got it wrong even though I teach Macbeth all the time and I've taught it for years. And I was so annoyed with myself. <laughs> so now I always remember it's in Inverness and I recommend that you guys do too because it might come up in a quiz one day. You never know. So, yeah, Macbeth's castle in Inverness. Um, Lady Macbeth is introduced, so that's an, an important scene again that you might highlight. Macbeth arrives and Lady Macbeth. I'm just going to make a note about um, formatting, the way that you should write names in essays. Always capitalise Lady Macbeth, so capital L, capital M, Macbeth. Um, so anytime someone's got a name or a title, capitalise both the name and the title. So Macbeth arrives and Lady Macbeth reveals her plan of killing Duncan. Macbeth is unsure, but Lady Macbeth is very persuasive and this reveals how their relationship works. This is really important because it establishes what we call a character dynamic. It establishes um, the relationship or the kind of uh, the positioning of one to another. So Macbeth in this type of society should be 
a more dominant presence whose voice is stronger than his wife, Lady Macbeth. And uh, generally, because it's patriarchal, the man is the one that makes all the decisions for the rest of his family, so his wife and his children. And uh, Lady Macbeth is not someone who actually conforms to this type of thinking. So Lady Macbeth subverts or twists that normal relationship rule, and she is more dominant and more persuasive, and she comes across as stronger than Macbeth, which is really strange because Macbeth is established as a very strong character. He's a very successful war general, so he's high up in society. He's not afraid of conflict and violence. So you wouldn't really think that he would get um, beaten down by his wife, but he does. <laughs> so it's kind of interesting about the difference between like physical strength and mental strength. It opens up all sorts of themes that we'll look at later in the Scribbly Courts. So Duncan arrives at the castle in 1.6 and he says, this castle hath a pleasant seat, which is a really, it's supposed to be a kind of funny scene because he's arriving and we know he's going to be killed. So it's a dramatic irony. And we know that they're planning to murder him and that they're evil and crazy. And Duncan's a really sweet, nice man. So he's like, oh, how lovely this castle looks pretty. And he's just kind of totally unaware of what's going to go on. So it's sort of sad, but it's also a bit funny because he's really, really oblivious and we've just seen exactly what is going on on the Macbeth side. Um, 1.7. Macbeth has a lot of important speeches or important kind of lines from speeches here. And mostly he just shows his uncertainty. So he's going back and forth over whether to kill Duncan or not and whether to agree or disagree with Lady Macbeth. So he's he's seen as a very conflicted and troubled soul at this point, and he's very confused about what he should do. And he's sort of torn between power and loyalty, I suppose you could say. So like, he wants to be king and he wants absolute power, but he also is really good friends with Duncan. Duncan's just done him a massive favor by promoting him and giving him a whole new land to look after and um you know it's it's massive betrayal it's also kind of weird because in one act he's gone from fighting and killing on behalf of duncan to thinking about and almost at the point where he kills duncan so he's his whole psyche and his whole like allegiance to um you know his beliefs and things what he believes in has totally changed because he obviously was willing to give his life for Duncan at the beginning of the play. By this point, he's he's the total opposite. So yeah, that's an important scene as well. So I'd like to just pause here and write down anything that you've thought was quite important from the um, act one. I spent quite a lot of time going over this one, so I'm going to speed up in the middle <laughs> so that it's not as like intense, but I thought it's important to kind of talk about the ideas that establish the the play and, and how the characters and the tensions are set up. So you can pause if you like and just spend a couple of minutes jotting anything important or useful down from what's been said, if you haven't been already, and then uh, when you're ready you can unpause and we'll move on to Act 2. So act two then, this is where what we call the rising action. So the, the actual action of the story is getting more intense and it's building up into something bigger and more dramatic. Banquo and Macbeth discuss the witch's predictions. Macbeth is very worried again. He starts to have hallucinations. These are very important. He sees a floating dagger covered in blood pointing to Duncan's room. He also hears a bell, which signals the end of the scene. The murder happens off stage, so we don't see it happen. This is really important. I actually forgot this a few years ago when I was teaching it, and I got really confused for a minute. But the murder of Duncan happens off stage. Um, why it's important is 
because I think the audience has been building up to thinking this is like, you know, this is going to be one of the key moments in the play when Duncan's finally murdered. And then it's sort of like what we call bathos, which is an anti-climax, because we don't actually see the murder. It just sort of happens in between 2.1 and 2.2. Um, yeah, so it's, it's kind of like an anti-climax. It's a bit surprising for the audience. It maybe gives Duncan, who's a really nice character, a little bit of dignity because we don't actually have to watch him being stabbed to death or whatever, however Macbeth does it in the end. Um, yeah, an important idea. So 2.2, Lady Macbeth is getting the guards drunk, so she's sort of part of the plan, the cover-up plan of like what they're going to do after Duncan's been killed and how they're going to how they're going to cover it up and who they're going to blame. Macbeth runs in, covered in blood, in a panic. He thinks that the guards woke up when he was doing it and he's very paranoid. Lady Macbeth has a go at him for being weak, which she does a lot and that's very important because that makes a big difference to his actions and decisions in the play, the fact that she's constantly having a go at his weaknesses. So both those scenes, I would say, are really important, and then that murder in between is also important. 2.3, Duncan is dead. Malcolm and Donald Bain. Let me just double check if it's Donald Bain or Donald Bain. I always get confused with that. Just give me one second, I'm gonna pause. Yeah, it is Donald Bain, not Donald. Um, so basically Duncan dies and the sons of Duncan are so freaked out and shocked and confused about how this could have happened and then they think that they're likely to be blamed for the murder because they obviously have an incentive like if their dad dies Malcolm becomes king so they think that they're going to be blamed for it and they just run away. Malcolm goes to England, Donald Bain goes to Ireland and then they're absent for much of the rest of the play. Lady Macbeth and Macbeth see this as an opportunity, so they're what we call opportunists. They find a moment where something kind of chaotic happened and they seize it and they use it to their advantage, uh, which is very clever. So they decide that that means they can pretend that they did actually murder uh, Duncan and therefore it makes them look noble and the sons look horrible, so it it gets rid of any chance of Malcolm actually being king, and instead it paves the way for, for Macbeth to be king. 2.4, Russ is another thane, and he's arguing with an old man. Macduff arrives to tell them that Macbeth has been made king. So this is an example of not such a key scene, I would say, but we hear that Macbeth is king and Macduff arrives for the first time in this one. So again with Act 2, I'll try and put it all on the board just roughly. Let me see. <laughs> it's difficult to get everything all on this board without making it too small. There we go. Yeah, so you can pause if you want, make a couple of notes for anything that's a key scene or anything that I said. Um, yeah, or take a, take a couple of minutes to read back over that to make sure that you fully understand what's happened so far. And then when you're ready, we'll move on. Good, so we're going to have a look at Act 3 now. This is bang in the middle because it's a five act structure. And most of, um, most kind of traditional classical plays are either a three act structure or a five act structure. So in this case, it's five acts, which gives us a bit more space between the beginning and end of the story. So act three, um, we see Banquo again, which is important. And he's worried in 3.1 about Macbeth. Not worried with Macbeth, worried about Macbeth. And he suspects Macbeth with conspiracy, of conspiracy. So he he says, 
now that Macbeth is king, he says, I fear thou playedst most foully for it. Meaning you didn't actually play the rules properly. I don't know if you've heard of Game of Thrones, but the, the themes and ideas of Game of Thrones are really similar to uh, Macbeth. Um, if you're GCSE, you probably can't watch that show because it's a bit too extreme. <laughs> but A level and above, if you're if you've watched Game of Thrones, um, that's a good primer. It's a good kind of foundation of how these things work. Probably, I think a lot of Game of Thrones is based on Macbeth because when I watch it, I do go through and I'm like, this is like in Macbeth, or this is like in a different play. Got some good source material. So. Um, Anyway, he says, I feared that played to most foully for it. So you're not playing the game right. You're not actually legitimately, honestly, and truly the king, but you've done it in a dodgy way and you did something bad. And that's how you became so successful so quickly. So um, he has this little speech and this is really Banco's time to shine. And um, Yeah, the Macbeths invite him to a feast, so he gets invited to dinner. And Macbeth goes on this kind of downward spiral of paranoia and fear and confusion, so he's gone from, um, you know, thinking that the prophecies might just be nonsense to actually fully believing in these prophecies, but also not quite being able to just let them happen as the witches said they would. Instead, he kind of feels the need to meddle and sort of help them to happen. So he's killed Duncan and he's blamed Duncan's sons. And he remembers the prophecy or the bit of the prophecy about Banquo where it says, thou shalt get king, so thou be not. And he's like, well, you know, you're also a threat to me now in his head. This is what he's thinking about Banquo. So he asks his servants to hire murderers to kill Banquo and his sons. And this is really important to so definitely highlight this if you've got it printed. And he says uh, it's, it's important that he is sort of too cowardly or maybe he just thinks it wouldn't work if he killed Banquo himself. But he doesn't actually, you know, go and face Banquo like a man. He just hires, he tells some of his people to go and hire some other people to go and kill him. So it's it's a very sneaky secretive thing to do it's not noble and honorable and we're told at the beginning how noble and brave Macbeth is so this is a very unbrave thing for such a brave man to do um yeah so it's kind of against his earlier nature because of the sneakiness of it it's also behind the back of Lady Macbeth which is a really important point to think about because you get um a lot of questions like how much is Macbeth responsible for his actions or how important is Lady Macbeth? All those kinds of essay questions. This is a really key moment for those because this is the first time Macbeth actually does something evil on his own. He doesn't tell Lady Macbeth she's got no involvement in killing Banquo, nothing to do with her. So maybe he's kind of, um, you know, bullied into being evil by Lady Macbeth up to this point and by the witches, he's kind of scared into being evil. But at this point, he's just doing stuff completely of his own free will. He's not, um, you know, no one's told him to kill Banquo. So, yeah, important scene. 3.2, Lady Macbeth is in a different part of the castle. She's stressed and panicking and <laughs> this is my student's sense of humour coming through, but I, I really like the way that he wrote because he is quite, uh, it's kind of funny like how he writes, so I sort of left it in rather than making it too academic. Because I, I don't really think it matters, you just need to know the story, so if you write it in a more fun way, you're more likely to remember. <laughs> Makes me laugh anyway. Yeah, so Lady Macbeth is in a different part of the castle, she's panicking, she's stressed, she calls for Macbeth to comfort her. He's also very stressed, so they just talk about their panic together. So, yeah, <laughs> kind of a funny description of that scene, but it shows quite a lot actually about psychology and about the spiral of evil that you kind of get, like if you start on the path of evil deeds, it just makes you do more and more, and in the meantime, you're 
you feel worse, like you have more of a conscience against that, you're more guilty or you're more paranoid. So both of them are massively um, struggling psychologically with their mental health about what they've done. You could argue that they're struggling with their mental health in the beginning because they want to kill their friends, but they're struggling in a different way now, in a more guilt-ridden, internal, uh, psychological kind of conflict type way. 3.3 3 is not one to highlight, but it's an important plot point. So the murderers attempt to kill Banquo and Fleance, Fleance is his son. It's a really silly word and for ages I couldn't re ever remember Banquo's son's name, but do try and remember it because you do have to sometimes talk about him in essays. Um, Fle Fleance gets away, Banquo dies. So that leaves it open for the prophecy to still be true because Banquo is dead, but he was told that he would never be king anyway and that his son would and his son still lives. So 3.4 um, is the feast. So the whole of Act 3 basically is about this feast so far. They're having a feast at the castle and the murderer comes in during the feast and tells Macbeth that Banquo's dead and Fleance uh, fled, Fleance ran away. And Macbeth starts to freak out because he thinks that this means the prophecy could still come true. And to be honest, he's getting more and more evidence for these prophecies coming true because everything that they said would happen has happened so far. So he starts panicking a bit and um, there's some really, really good performances of this scene where Macbeth just like, so he starts acting really mental and it's really weird because everyone's like meant to be having a good time. Lady Macbeth sort of just tries to say that he's drunk or he's too exhausted because he's he's had like too much on his mind, so he's just gone a bit mad. Um, but yeah, he's, he sort of starts acting a bit weird and then he sees Banquo's ghost and he completely freaks out. So. Uh, I think it just says enter the ghost of Banquo or something, but it's a good line to remember, especially because you should actually analyse stage directions as well as quotations in your essays. That's something that's really important to do. So, uh, yeah, the ghost just kind of stands around, doesn't really do anything, but that's enough to freak Macbeth out and Lady Macbeth can't see it, so she has no idea what, he's, what on earth is happening, but she just tries to make it seem like it's fine. So I'd say 3.4 is a really key seed that you would highlight. 3.5 is weird. Some, some people say that it's not even Shakespeare that wrote it and it was just randomly put in there. But the witches make meet Hecate, who's kind of like their god goddess, their like a higher power. Um, so it's it's more, I think, there to remind you that the witches are still around and that they're kind of doing things in the background. 3.6, Lennox discusses what's happened. People think Fleance killed Banquo, a parallel to the murder of Duncan, because people think uh, Malcolm and Donalbane killed Duncan. But Lennox starts to think that it was Macbeth. So this is kind of like a slightly pivotal moment, we could say, like the end of Act 3, because he starts, instead of being, you know, more and more powerful and kind of getting everything going better and better for Macbeth, he's starting to come a bit unstuck and going a bit mad and Lady Macbeth's also starting to panic and people are starting to suspect them. So the whole kind of mechanism of the play is turning and it's going down. So it's, it's been kind of on an upward trajectory where they've been doing really well. At this point, it all starts getting weirder and worse for them. So again, you're welcome to pause, write out anything that you think is important from that if you like. And uh, when you're ready, we can move on to that. So Act 4, we're almost there. <laughs> Sorry, this is very like, I'm talking quickly and I'm kind of whizzing through stuff, but I just wanted to give you an understanding of the shape of the story as quickly as possible so that you can see how each scene and each bit of it actually fits into the whole because um, without, without that understanding of what we call part to whole, you can't get a good grade on your essays if you only focus on the scene and not what happens around it. 
So um, yeah, <laughs> it's one of those lessons where you just have to listen to me natter and then pause every so often and jot stuff down. Um, yeah, so act four, a parallel to the first scene, the witches appear, Macbeth asks them for help and they give three more predictions. So um, yeah, it's really important because this is kind of uh, starting to repeat itself now, but it doesn't end the same way for Macbeth as the first few acts did. So they say, worry about Macduff, but don't worry because no one who is, um, no one who is uh, born of a woman, so no, no person who's ever been born will harm you. And you'll be king until the forest comes to the, the hill where the castle is, Dunsinane Hill. So Macbeth worries about Macduff, but he's also pretty uh, consoled about this kind of thing because he, he's like, well, the other two prophecies seem completely mental. Firstly, everyone is born. There's no one existing who's not born. So um, that seems like no one can hurt him. And then secondly, the idea that a forest would move towards and up to a castle just seems impossible. It's kind of silly how impossible he thinks that is because if you think about it in actual Macbeth world, there are witches and prophecies and ghosts and visions, like he sees floating daggers, you know, so it shouldn't really, I don't think, be that shocking to him that it could happen. But he seems 100% sure that's never gonna happen. So I, I don't really know, um, why that is but I always find it a bit weird that he's not more worried about that because other very unusual and unbelievable stuff you know happens all the time in, in Macbeth's world but yeah the second one it makes it seem like he's pretty safe so he's worried about um oh, my grandma. because he's worried about Macduff he murders his wife and children which is obviously a terrible idea because it's just going to cause more anger. I think he tries to murder Macduff and Macduff's not there or something. I can't quite remember this plot point, which is bad, isn't it? Look it up. Don't, <laughs> don't quote me on that one. Because uh, off the top of my head, I've for some reason forgot that little detail. So 4.2, Macduff's castle. Lady Macduff is annoyed since she thinks he abandoned everyone. A group of murderers arrive. They attempt to kill them. One of the sons runs away. Lady Macduff and, and Macduff are a parallel to Macbeth and Lady Macbeth. So yeah, it's kind of interesting because they are a parallel and they always sound the same as all well, Macduff, Macbeth, they're almost the same word. But then Macduff is the nice one and he's like got a sense of righteousness and who should properly be on the throne. And Mac Beth obviously doesn't, um, but it, it is important that there's all these parallels and the stuff repeating itself, and um, even the murder of the king is repeating itself because at the beginning there's the Thane of Cawdor trying to murder the king, and then Macbeth becomes the Thane of Cawdor, and then he also tries to murder the king. So it's about this like cycle of violence and history repeating itself and human nature. Um, and it's, yeah, it's really interesting when you, you think about it in those complex levels, but that's beyond the scope of today's lesson because we're just doing a summary. So we'll look at that probably in the themes lesson if you're interested in those types of ideas. Yeah, so 4.3, Macduff and Malcolm decide to test each other out. Malcolm says he's going to return with 10,000 soldiers Macduff learns that his wife and children have been killed and vows revenge. Yes, it's, it sounds like um, Macduff was away when, when his wife was killed. Again, just look it up because I'm not sure. Um, yeah, so the, the testing each other out is quite interesting, I suppose, because Malcolm... Um, you know, people do believe at this point that he's killed his dad. So Macduff doesn't truly 100% trust him when he goes to go goes to see him. 
but he really, really doesn't like Macbeth and he thinks that something weird is going on. So he decides to go and see Malcolm and decide for himself. And then, um, yeah, they hatch a plan to come back and, and fight, basically. So again, with this one, you can pause and highlight anything you think is important or just write down any important uh, notes. For some reason, Act 4 is always my least favourite. I don't really enjoy it that much to watch and it just kind of goes, not even that many scenes in it, is there? I should have <laughs> three scenes. I don't know why I get so annoyed by it, but I really like um, the other bits. I think it's because it's not really got witches or anything in it. And I know it does in, in 4.1 actually. Yeah, I have no idea then. I don't know why, but it's my least favourite act. I like the, the other one's better. I think it's because, like, loads of dramatic things have happened and then this is quite a slow act because it's building up into the final act, which is deliberate structural technique that does help with the story. So, yeah, anyway, I'm, I'm just blathering at you. Just <laughs> pause me, stop listening to me, write whatever you need and then come back and I'll not keep nattering, I'll go into act five. So, final act. Lots of tiny little scenes, which is important if you're making structure points and you have to talk about structure and form as well as language which is why in your essays you want to memorise stage directions, like I was saying earlier, and you want to know how the, the whole story is shaped and structured because you can't get good structure points without, without knowing the shape. So one thing I find really interesting about Act 5 before we delve into it is the fact that there's loads of scenes here, there's eight, and they're so short and they keep skipping around and chopping and it's in the middle of a battle, so it, it just creates a very chaotic feel to this act like everything's kind of happening very quickly and skipping about and you feel disoriented and that's deliberate and that's a really clever technique that helps us it kind of captures the feeling of battle and the captures the feeling of panic and it compresses all of the story and makes it all intensely sort of compound and end really dramatically so yeah I think very cleverly written by Shakespeare so 5.1, I always think this is a really important scene. Um, Lady Macbeth has been sleepwalking and she's kind of like confessing things in her sleep. So it's really dodgy because <laughs> she, uh, yeah, she's not in her right mind anymore. So she's just like completely rambling, kind of like I am now, <laughs> but with worse stuff than what I'm saying. Yeah, so she's just rambling and, and blathering about um, all the kind of terrible stuff she's done and her conscience has got the better of her and uh, she's obsessed with her hands so she's like out damn spot out I say and she starts talking about hell and she says hell is murky so there's a doctor on this um, on the scene I think or someone and they're sort of commenting like maybe a doctor and a servant can't quite remember but there's two people in the back who are watching her on stage and they're commenting on what she's doing and she's just no idea that they're there and she's just kind of like off in her own little mind so yeah it's quite a sort of shocking scene to see this really powerful uh, woman who's so sure of herself to the point where she's like forcing her husband to do exactly what she thinks because she's sure she's right and totally twists and then it, you know she's completely confused not aware of her surroundings really panicked and really weak it's, it's very interesting to see that character development that she's undergone from a very strong to very weak person. So yeah, I'd, um, I'd highlight that scene if you've got it printed and make a note of it if not. And uh, yeah, it's always, as long as you get a good actress playing Lady Macbeth, it's always a, like one of my favourite scenes in the play, I think, just because it's really interesting and... Um, it's quite private and personal as well, and it's just before all of the fighting and the chaos, so it, it's a very like kind of quiet moment in the play, I think. Kind of a creepy quiet moment before all the all the madness. So then 
Um, outside the castle, the army has prepared to attack. So Malcolm's army arrives, Macduff arrives, and um, they call him a tyrant. So Macduff actually calls Macbeth a tyrant. It's a good word to remember as a quote. It's a good word to make sure you understand what it means. Like a terrible ruler who kind of rules through doing what they want rather than what's best for their people. So they really hate Macbeth. Oh, Macduff hates Macbeth at this point. And Macbeth um, hears the news in 5.3 and he's very confident that he'll be fine. Even though the battle is quite a long way off still, he puts his armour on and he learns that Lady Macbeth is going crazy and asks, uh, you know, to send a doctor to fix her. So he's not focused at all on his wife, he's just focused on his castle. They're apart at this moment, so they're not supporting each other like a normal husband and wife should. 5.4, Malcolm decides to cut down the forest and carries the trees to the castle to disguise um, the actual numbers of the soldiers. Yeah, so it's a kind of camouflage that makes them makes it less easy to see that the soldiers are advancing, and it's also um, a way to kind of hide just how many there are, so that Macbeth will feel overconfident, or he'll um, it'll be harder for him to kind of make battle tactics to fight them because he's not really sure what's going on. So this is obviously the prophecy being fulfilled because the forest is chopped down and being used to, uh, you know, as camouflage carried up to the castle. 5.5, 5. 5. Macbeth is boastful that his castle will stand. He orders banners to be hung. Um, you hear a woman scream. So this is again an important stage direction. There's a scream off stage. And then Macbeth learns that Lady Macbeth has killed herself. And his reaction is really crazy. So this is like one of my, uh, again, one of my favorite moments in the play because it's really mental. And he's like, well, I'll probably be joining her soon enough or something. Like he's really not in his right mind and he doesn't reply in the way that you'd expect. And uh, yeah, a messenger tells him that the forest has come to the castle so he knows the prophecies come true and he decides that he will die fighting which is a really interesting point because it's like does he regain his honor a bit by deciding to die and face them nobly and he sort of shows his bravery again because it's like even if he's gonna die he'll at least give it a go <laughs> uh, he could just flee and run away and he wouldn't be king but he, he would still be alive um, but he doesn't flee, so he, he sort of shows his bravery in a way. So some people interpret that as quite brave and noble, and in some ways it kind of restores his honour a little bit because he's actually playing by the rules now. And other people just think it's, it's stupidity or madness. So it's interesting to identify plot points when there's some ambiguity there and you're not sure how you're supposed to interpret it and there's different ways it can be taken because those always make for really complex scenes that can be analysed deeply. So, a couple more then. Battle starts, Macbeth seems to be winning, Macduff is searching for Macbeth. And then, Malcolm and Seward enter the castle, Macbeth and Macduff fight, so this is the most important scene out of the fighting scenes. And Macduff says, I was from my mother's womb untimely ripped. Um, because Macbeth is like, no man born of a woman can harm me, or she'll harm Macbeth, or something like that. And Macduff's like, well, I wasn't technically born. I was uh, delivered by Caesarian. So then Macbeth knows finally that he's definitely going to die because all of those prophecies have all come true. He's really annoyed as well at the witches because they tricked him. <laughs> but, I mean, I don't know what to expect. Like, I think one of the morals of this story is just don't trust witches, obviously actually not like the evil kind of witch that he encounters. They're obviously mental. I don't know why he's like, oh yeah, I'll trust them, they're my friends. But anyway, uh, yeah, Macbeth realizes he's been tricked by the witches, that he's gonna die, that everything's gone wrong and so on. 
So Macduff arrives with Macbeth's head. Malcolm curses Macbeth and his wife, so he's really angry. And Malcolm becomes the rightful king. So order is restored. The true bloodline of kings that started with Duncan is restored. So even though Duncan's dead, his line continues. The line continuing is really important because if you have um, a king who dies and doesn't leave an heir, then they're only really in power for like, you know, however long they're alive, like 30 years or whatever. So they're having lots of sons who then have sons and all of those sons become king. That ensures that your family are in charge for a lot longer and, and kings are quite into that idea. <laughs> it's quite important as a king, especially in this time, that you can, you know, have multiple generations of your family on the throne. So, um, yeah, so Malcolm's king, everything's back to normal, sort of. And uh, it's kind of interesting because the heroic character dies, Macbeth dies, and he's our sort of hero, he's the main figure. But because he's a tragic hero, he's doomed to die. And then the world is restored to order through his death. So it's a happy ending, even though the main character dies, which is, um, I always think is quite interesting because you only really get that in tragedy plays in a normal film or something, that wouldn't really, it wouldn't work that way. So yeah, um, if you're gonna highlight from act five, I would say 5.1, maybe 5.4, and 5.5, and then this one, 5.10, they're the important scenes from that act. So, I know I've just been rambling you for 50 minutes. Hopefully that's been useful and your brain is a little bit blasted, but knowing the full story of Macbeth and all of the little details within 50 minutes is a pretty impressive feat. So well done with your with yourself for staying awake and paying attention. And um, yeah, hopefully you're feeling a lot more confident on Macbeth and you're gonna enjoy the rest of this course. I'm really looking forward to this course, especially because one of my favourite plays and I love Shakespeare so um, yeah so hopefully you enjoy it along with me and thank you for listening and I'll see you again soon in the future lessons.